Hello, you creature of the internet. My name is Elle, and I am the host of a DID system called the Mage System. So, dissociative identity disorder is a dissociative disorder characterized by separate states of identity existing in one body. I'll save you the whole spiel, but essentially, DID is caused by both repeated childhood trauma that is too intense to handle and a disorganized detachment from the primary caregivers. This all takes place before the age of 10. The child's personality becomes unable to comprehend these experiences, and before they are old enough to even form a cohesive sense of self, the identity dissociates from itself into fragments that concern themselves with different aspects of the child's conflicting environment. We've been hearing murmurs of autism's connection to DID for a while, so let's break it down. A few weeks ago, I got into a kerfuffle with somebody on TikTok who had DID who was making a video about how autism cannot possibly contribute to forming DID, and I felt like they were getting mad, so I eventually stopped replying, but it made me realize that this is the perfect topic, so I did my research. So today, me and my studies that I have researched are going to tell you why having autism makes it easier to form DID. But first, before we start, I just want to say thank you for being here. If we haven't shaken hands before, we make creative content about DID on this channel. You'll like it. All right, I'm going to put all of my sources on screen, uh, and then you can look at them in the description if you want to look more into them. There is limited research on this topic, so I was limited to only a few papers that I could find because no one's actually really ran the numbers on what percentage of... DID people have autism compared to the normal population. So diving in, autism tends to be known for its increased comorbidity with seemingly any kind of condition or disorder from chronic physical conditions across all organ systems, including but not limited to gastrointestinal issues like ulcers, GERD, IBS, and more, sleep disorders, some genetic disorders like fragile X syndrome, neurological conditions like Tourette's, epilepsy, and migraines, and of course, mental disorders. Depression, anxiety, OCD, ADHD, bipolar disorder, a host of personality disorders, and the list goes on and on. And post-traumatic stress disorder. A study of 687 autistic individuals found that 44% tested positive on a PTSD screening. 44%. And compared to the 6% of the general population that has PTSD, that is pretty crazy. So it seems like autistic people are a lot more likely to be traumatized. Like, a lot. So why? If you've seen my How CPTSD is Almost DID video, then you'll know that DID is essentially just a severe form of childhood PTSD. The structural dissociation model goes from PTSD to complex PTSD to BPD to partial DID to DID. Do you see where I'm going with this? And we've only just begun. Remember those two things I mentioned that in combination cause DID? Repeated childhood trauma and a disorganized attachment to the primary caregiver. Let's break down both of those and how they relate to autism. So why are autistic people more likely to be traumatized? As discussed before, being autistic makes it more likely that you will have a host of co-occurring physical and mental conditions. The brain and body of autistic individuals are often more sensitive to their surroundings, both physical and emotional stimuli. They are hyper aware of the finer details around them and can't tune things out as well. From how medications and food affect the body, to bright lights, loud sounds, and itchy sweaters, to being rejected, harassed, and ignored. Not to mention those latter things are far more likely to happen if you're autistic, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Between sensory issues, pathological demand avoidance, social anxiety, anxiety anxiety, a social alienation, and forced changes in routine right out the womb, us autistic people can't catch a break. From a young age, autistic kids have a rude awakening of an overstimulating environment that they have to find a way to cope with fast. This often automatically equips them with dissociative skills from the time they are small. The only way to escape is in your own head. They are too small to fight or fly. Not to mention that abuse, neglect, and mistreatment is far more common of an experience among autistic individuals. This is for a variety of reasons. It is no secret that it is devastatingly, disproportionately more likely for autistic children to experience bullying, harassment, and abuse, 
not only from peers, but from adults as well. On top of that, autistic people are more likely to have experienced sexual violence. One reason for this may be that, since not being able to read others is a symptom of autism, judging the intentions of someone who may be manipulating, grooming, or lying to you may be much more difficult for autistic children and adults. Basically, if you tell them you have candy in your big white van, they're more likely to actually believe that you have candy in your big white van. This, on top of potential learned people-pleasing from social rejection, a lot of autistic children become the target of sickos. Autistic children may also face more abuse from authority figures like teachers and parents due to their needs being mistaken as selfish or annoying and thus facing punishment, like meltdowns in public, pathological demand avoidance, which is a symptom of neurodivergence that involves perceiving demands as threats. So if your parent tells you to do something, since the autistic child doesn't perceive a social hierarchy as they don't perceive social structures as well, it can often really trigger them to be told what to do, which is a very, very real and hard symptom. Their lack of social awareness, not understanding certain things, etc., can make it more likely that the child will receive mistreatment from stressed caregivers. If not mistreatment, their needs just might be ignored, which can have terrible consequences for the kid. Just look at extreme ABA treatments for autistic children where they are essentially punished for showing symptoms of autism. These ideas are deep-rooted into how society treats autistic kids. Not to mention, a lot of these children aren't even diagnosed, so parents and teachers don't realize why the child has certain needs. This can lead to suppression, dissociation, and internalized shame. Now let's look at that second factor in forming DID, a disorganized attachment from the primary caregivers. This is a kind of insecure attachment from which the caregivers act inconsistently towards the child being more loving one moment, neglectful the next, and mean and abusive the next. It's very confusing for a kid. On the other hand, secure attachment is when the parents respond to the child's needs and give them enough love and are not mean or neglectful. 65% of the population has a secure attachment style, compared to the 47% of autistic children that get one. This is likely due to the factors mentioned before, but I also wanted to read this really important bit of information from Dissociation and Autism Spectrum Disorder, a systematic review. Additionally, parents may feel disconnected from their autistic child due to the child's difficulties with eye contact, conversation, physical contact, and the stress of raising a disabled child. So, I just laid out how autistic children are more likely to face the two required experiences for forming DID. Now, let's talk about why these two experiences are more likely to culminate into dissociative identity disorder for autistic children who experience them. Autism is dissociate... Autism is associated with dissociation in a variety of ways. There are four types of dissociation laid out here, and I'm going to break down how autism can make it more likely to experience each one. Derealization is the act of dissociating from one's environment and the things going on around them. So the trauma that people experience invokes a fight or flight response, but more accurately, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. A lot of times, whenever autistic children are overwhelmed, it's not socially acceptable to have a meltdown, especially if you haven't been diagnosed and you are really just being told to suck it up all the time. And you also can't just run away because in many of these scenarios, it's frowned upon for the child to seem visibly distressed. Dissociating from one's surroundings may be the brain's go-to. Depersonalization is depersonalizing from one's own thoughts, feelings, body, what what have you, that's what depersonalization is. It's dissociating from yourself. So alexithymia is basically being cut off from your emotions. Approximately half of autistic people have trouble comprehending and describing their emotions. Not only do autistic individuals often neurologically develop this trait, but they may be more predisposed to doing it as their response to stress. Identity disturbance, confusion, and alteration. There's a few elements to this. So one of the things I'm going to talk about just briefly for a second is gender identity because I thought it would just be an interesting thing to add. Autistic people, I, I forgot to actually look up the actual statistic, but they're so much more likely to be trans or just have um, a non-conforming gender presentation because gender is a social structure and a lot of autistic people 
do not conform to social structures and it often leads to that kind of thing. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Masking. So masking is something a lot of people with different mental illnesses do, like pretending you feel fine when you're depressed. But it is particularly pervasive among autistic people pretending to be neurotypical, putting on a persona of social comfortability and normalcy, which can be to such an extent that their entire personality is covered up. From my own and others' experiences, this can lead to chronic identity issues where you're not sure if it's just the mask or if it's really you or who you actually are. Not to mention that our lack of intuitive connection to social structures can lead to a messy sense of identity outside of that. Us humans develop a lot of our identities based on what our peers are doing, from your third grade best friend showing you his Pokemon cards to wanting to dress like the pretty girls at school. Our personalities adjust to our surroundings, which is the reason for, like, a lot of behavior of individuals within various demographics in society. It's like one of the basics of sociology. Autistic people often have an inherent disconnection to these surrounding influences and thus may have an atypical connection to their identity. And the last type of dissociation, amnesia. Memory difficulties of various kinds is a well-documented and common symptom of autism. Autistic people often preserve their semantic memories, which is memories of things you learned or facts, while they often have deficits in episodic memory, which is memories of personal life experiences. So while you may remember oddly specific trivia about the Five Nights at Freddy's saga, you can't remember learning to ride a bike. While there is limited research available about autistic people's likelihood of acquiring amnesia after a traumatic event in comparison to neurotypicals, you can see their inclination towards losing memories of life events in combination with the pre-established connections to dissociative symptoms. I have a personal hypothesis, but you can make your own theories. Now that we have discussed four types of dissociation, now let's talk about fantasy and absorption proneness, because this is a big one. The paper Dissociation and Autism Spectrum Disorder, an Underrecognized System, explains it better than I ever could. Absorption refers to one's ability to become absorbed in fantasy and imagination. While it is unclear to what extent absorption may itself be considered an inherently dissociative experience, studies point towards an association between absorption and other more centrally dissociative factors such as compartmentalization, as well as with psychopathology more generally. Fantasy proneness, a related construct, refers to the trait of being drawn to immersive inner fantasy, with highly fantasy-prone individuals being inclined towards spending long portions of time engaging in daydreaming or other fantasy-based activities like role-playing. This, too, shows some correlation with dissociative experiences more generally. The stereotypical image of autism is one of a genius without imagination. That is, autistic individuals have been typically viewed as having a somehow deficient capacity for imagination and creativity. However, attention to autistic individuals' own narratives uncovers the important role of fantasy and imagination for many. In her study of a summer camp for autistic youth, Fane, 2020, argues that these youth identified strongly with fictional characters from literature, video games, and their own creation, to the extent that these fantasy worlds can further prove deeply personally meaningful for the individual. It may be the case, then, that an interest in fantasy could mediate a relationship between autism and dissociation. Early research also indicates that autistic traits may be specifically associated with pathological absorption in the form of maladaptive daydreaming. If you've been around for a while, you'll know that fantasy and escapism plays a huge role in DID's existence. It is often a form of escapism from bad things, and fictives alters that our fictional characters are common. Also, monotropism, a key feature of autism that means only being able to focus attention on a few things while neglecting other things, is of course very related to absorption and fantasy. Absorption is kind of a dissociative experience in the same way that highway hypnosis is and how time flies when you're locked in and focused on something. Neurodivergent people have the tendency to do this a lot. 
And so I'm sure you can see how these ideas connect to proneness to forming DID. So to swiftly recap what I've laid out here, I have explained how autism makes it more likely to accumulate childhood trauma through sensitivity and through increased likelihood of abuse and neglect, and how it makes it more likely to form a disorganized attachment to the primary caregiver, which are the two necessary factors in forming DID. Then I explained four key types of dissociation and how autism is more or less correlated with each one. And then I read to you about how autism correlates with fantasy absorption and compartmentalization. So take with all of that what you will, but in my opinion, without being able to actually look at any research on how common DID is, in, is with autism because no one's actually done that study that I could find anyways, I would hypothesize that autism makes it easier to form DID. If you liked the video, like it. If you disliked the video, dislike it. I always love hearing everyone's comments, questions, concerns, constructive criticism, as long as you're nice. Thank you so much for watching. If you are coming back, you've been here before, check and see if you're subscribed because sometimes I will check and see if I'm subscribed to a YouTuber that I've been watching for a long time and I realize that I never got around to subscribing to them, so that could be you. Anyways, I have to go. Bye.